Exodus 1, 7. The unsung heroes of Exodus is not only Moses, but the women who surround Moses. And one of the things that we see of women in Exodus is that they reflect God's image by being deliverers, deliverers of Israel. Deliverers in more than one way. They are not only delivering babies or bearing babies, bearing new life, which is the strength of the people of Israel, but also those midwives who are literally delivering children and therefore acting as as vessels of God's salvation. When you read the Bible of Exodus, we're within the climactic story of God's, God's gospel story in the Old Testament. Exodus shapes the rest of the gospel narrative in that the, the Exodus event tells us who God is, reveals the character of God, is the time when God calls a people unto himself, sets them on the wilderness to a land of promise, and it is the Exodus story that shapes the rest of the narrative. Jesus dies on the cross as what? A lamb of God. He dies on the cross on Passover. That is an Exodus event. So Exodus is not only profoundly important in the story, uh, the gospel story of the Bible, but we also launch that gospel story with these women who are unsung heroes uh, within scripture. I taught a little bit bit about this lesson on the sanctity of life, so some of this may be familiar for you, but we're going to see it and talk about it. So let's jump into Exodus 1, 7. And I'm going to kind of go read through this and, and refer to the notes every now and then. 1-7. But the Israelites were fruitful and prolific. That's language right out of Genesis. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. I like Robert Alter's translation. This is in your notes. And the sons of Israel were fruitful and swarmed and multiplied and grew very vast, and the earth was filled with them. I love this idea of of swarming people. It gives you the image that this is a um, this is a, a, a a people who are occupying Israel, and the key word is they grew very strong. In this era of history, the strongest person in the room was Pharaoh, and the strength of Egypt as a dominant empire and world power will now be confounded by a people who are slaves. Much more so, not only slave, a slave class, labor class, but the women of the slave labor class. So when you think about a God who redeems and liberates, this is a God who calls people who have no voice to have a prophetic voice and imbues the, the, the powerless with power. And it starts here with this idea that not only did they become fruitful and multiply, fulfilling that commission of Genesis but also growing exceedingly strong and giving the image of this swarming occupational um, or or occupying power. Um, uh, Not infestation, but rather uh, an invasion of of this occupying power. Um, And this threatens the strength of Egypt. So let's keep reading in verse 8. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more what? More what? Powerful. They're more powerful than we are. This is a statement of fear. Pharaoh comes off as the fearful, powerless statesman in the face of a labor class who is literally striking fear in the most, the mightiest empire in the known world. This is, this is, uh, this is really important because when Jesus comes on the scene, what does Jesus say to the powerful? The first shall become what? Last, and the last shall become first. This is an identifying character marker of the identity of God. This is who God is. The first shall become last, and the last shall become first. Okay? This is exactly what Jesus preached, this kind of ethic. It begins in Exodus. Actually, it begins in Genesis, but it carries into Exodus. Uh, Verse 10. Uh, Let's see here. Verse uh, 10, come, let us deal shrewdly. This word for shrewdly, by the way, Mitzi, any other word in the King James? Wisely. Wisely, okay. The reason why I have shrewdly is because this Hebrew word wisely is the negative type of wisdom. This isn't like let's be wise. This is the kind of wisdom that is a shrewd negative wisdom. If you read Proverbs, um, 
it says things like the fools will deal shrewdly with so-and-so. So this word for shrewd is more of a negative wisdom, okay, uh, used in this sense. And they will, in, uh, or they will increase and in an event of war join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, therefore, verse 11, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they oppressed, they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread and fear the Israelites. Two things going on. Oppression, the word oppression appears twice in this passage to reinforce the oppression going on through forced labor. Pharaoh says, let us deal ruthlessly with them. So this is no like cakewalk here. You know, this isn't like a middle class people like trying to get their way. This is real true oppression with ruthless task masking. But the funny thing is they are trying to build storehouses for Egypt in the ancient world, storehouses stored the amassing of resources. So while Egypt is, is amassing resources, showing off its wealth in the storehouses, again, that slave labor class is undermining that power. So there's a contrast between the, those who amass these, all of these resources in the known world and those who have nothing and are being oppressed. Uh, it's like that parable that Jesus told. You remember the parable in which it says, uh, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who uh, was running out of room and he needed to build a new uh, silo. And he said, self, what do I do? Well, I think I'm going to build a new silo. And then God comes to him that very evening, strikes him dead and says, tonight your soul is demanded of you. And uh, and he doesn't get to take his stuff from the silo. There's this uh, There's this parable about about the, the idea of the, of the shining beacon of power and the swarming horde that is striking fear. This contrast between the power of Egypt and the power of the people are, are, are coming to the forefront. Verse 12, but the more, uh, I already read that. Verse 13, the Egyptians became ruthless, there's that word again, and imposing tasks on Israel and the, and the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that were, that they imposed on them. Work, 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 ruthless work. The, the word for work appears three times in these verses. What was the one thing that God commanded his people to do so that work would not define who they are? Rest, Sabbath. Yeah. So the rhythm that God put in place was to have a Sabbath rest so that not only you rest, but the animals of the field, the field itself, and the labor in your midst. And every seven years, you were to have a Sabbath year. And not only in which everyone rests, but your labor could return to their land and you can restore and cancel all debts. And we find this later on, instituted later on in Exodus and, and Deuteronomy, because Work, endless toil and work, ruthless oppression defined the power of Egypt. And when God calls his people unto himself and institutes the Sabbath, God will have none of it. Neither work will not define you, one, and two, you will not have slave labor. And if you do have indentured servanthood, you will release those slaves every seven years so that no man owes another man a debt. Why? Because when you're in debt, you're in slavery, according to this worldview. So this defining power of Egypt sets up the, the ethic that God puts in place in the law. And this is about sanctity of life. I, when I taught the sanctity of life, I taught that this was a key component, the Sabbath rest, was the acknowledgement that people are not beholden to one another. God created a multitude of birds and animals. God created a multitude of plants and fish. God created a, a multitude of, of, of stars, but he only created one man so that no one can say, my father is better than your father. That's an old Jewish proverb, by the way. Okay? All right, let's keep reading. The king said to the Hebrew, the, verse 15, this is where the, we, we zoom in on the story. The king, said to the, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. 
but if it is a girl, she shall live. First policy is that of death, genocide. Okay, this is the first policy that Pharaoh puts in place, kill all the boys. By the way, God will punish the Israel, the Egyptians later with that 10th commandment. Anybody remember what the 10th commandment is? Firstborn. Kill the firstborn, yeah. So it's a, it's a measured response of justice. So the first policy is kill the boys, okay? Verse 17, but the midwives feared God. By the way, do you know the name of the Pharaoh so far? Anybody know the name of the Pharaoh in chapter 1? No, we don't know the name of the Pharaoh. But whose names do we know? Shepra and Ruah. No, Ramses, the name is not... The city of Ramses mentioned in this book, right? No, no, what I'm saying is, notice how the Pharaoh remains unnamed in Exodus 1. But we have two names, Shipra and Perua. Remember what I told you about names last week, about how names hold authority? So the Hebrew text is going out of its way to say, the Pharaoh will remain unnamed because he's a nobody. He's like a straw figure in the power of God. But we're going to name these heroes who have no voice and have no identity apart from their careers as midwives. Again, part of the labor class. All right? But they feared God. That's the key. 18. Uh, and they let the boys live. Verse 18. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous. <laughs> that, is, that is supposed to bring a chuckle. Um, because uh, uh, the Hebrew is very good at irony and satire. How do you make fun of your oppressors? Tell them that their women aren't as vigorous as yours. I don't know. Now, it's a joke, but I'm, I'm serious. The Hebrew is very good at satire. If you want to make the king the butt of the joke, make him to be somebody who has no power and basically infertile. It's just one of those things. Read 1 Kings chapter 1 and note the difference between King David at the end of his life and Solomon by the, end of, by, by the time you reach 1 Kings uh, about 3 or 4 where King David's power is, is, is decreasing uh, and, and Solomon's power is increasing. Uh, and there is a satire in there, or an undertone, of this, this idea of, uh, uh, of these vigorous uh, uh, women, so to speak. Sorry, guys. Um, before the midwife comes to them. And, and, and again, this is satire putting the Egyptians as the butt of the joke. Those who have no power are more powerful than those who claim to have power. And not only power, but are amassing it in these storehouses. Verse 21. And because the midwives, uh, oh, let me see. Oh, verse 20. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very what? Numerous. Numerous. Somebody else have something else? Mighty, strong, it's strong, mighty. Yeah, numerous and strong and mighty. It's actually mighty and strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Again, this is kind of a declaration that God is honoring their house rather than, than Pharaoh's house. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. This is, um, let me see if this is the second policy. This is on the back. And sorry about the reverse thing on the back of your sheet. I, I didn't get the computer right. I know. This is his um, third policy in which he deputizes the citizenry and commands everyone to pitch the babies into the Nile. If you have no power, what do you do? You deputize people to take matters into their own hands. And by deputizing the people, now the people become the police officers, and literally the, the language is pitch them into the Nile, throw them into the Nile. Now you've got to remember the pitching because this becomes important with Moses' story, okay? And the centrality of the Nile River, which basically becomes that symbol of the war between God and Pharaoh. What is the first, uh, one, one of the first plagues of of Moses or God over Egypt by turning the Nile red, right? So the Nile becomes the central uh, kind of environment in which these two superpowers, 
Okay, the enslaved Israelites who have no power in Egypt will will come to fruition. And it's every boy that is born to the Hebrew storm, it's and all. So he deputizes the people. Um, I'll say this because you guys can ask me about this later, even though I don't have time today. I got to run after church, so I'm going to run out. So if you ask me, you have a question, I'm going to run away from you. But whenever the government deputizes people to do the work of the government, in some cases, be very, very careful. Okay, be very careful. Because even if it's for a righteous cause, it can turn basically the government into a a machine of of suspicion and spies. So how do you not do the right thing? You're afraid your neighbor is going to rat you out, right? It's it's more than that. It's when you deputize your citizens, you raise. You not only do you pit pit people against themselves, but the environment comes one of suspicion and of secrecy rather than of life and of flourishing. Okay. Don't worry about me. Yeah. Even if, and I want I don't want you to pay attention. Even if if it is for a righteous what you think is a righteous cause. Okay? Because today it may be a righteous cause on your side of the policy. Tomorrow it might be a righteous cause for the other side of the political party because the other side may be in power. So no matter if you're the one in power and you're deputizing your people to support your policies, be careful because you may be on the receiving end next week. But Pharaoh's way is to deputize the people. By the way, vigilantism and deputization of, of people is forbidden in the Hebrew Bible. God is the one who exacts justice through the judges not the people. Um, and, um, and there is a system for how to go about justice, due process, built into the Torah itself. That's why we call the Torah what? Anybody know? The five books of Moses are the, also called the, the law. The law. Torah means law. Because the law sets out boundaries for how people are to relate to one another. Because remember, God is in the business of restoring relationships between people. No people shall be indebted to others for more than six years. No one shall be enslaved to others and work tirelessly. And Egypt represents everything that is far from the very heart and ethic of God. This is a sanctity of life section that reaches into the deepest aspects of life and justice. And the women are at the heart of it. Because before we get to questions, I don't want to keep you long. I want to go into chapter 2 to show you how this works out. Read verses 1 through 10. All right? Chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was fine, a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him. That word for basket, uh, what is that in the King James? Ark. It's the same word as Noah's Ark. She got a ark. It's the same word used for Noah's Ark. She got an ark. Whenever you see that ark in scripture, it's that redeeming kind of vessel. There's an ark, Noah. There's an ark for Moses that will save him. And there's an ark for the covenant, right? So very cool stuff. Very intentional language. Uh, when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus ark for him and plastered it with uh, bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and pitched him into the Nile? No. She placed him into the Nile, into the reeds, on the bank of the river. So rather than pitching, we have the opposite. She's placing the baby into the reeds. By the way, what does the reeds remind you of? The, the reed sea, right? So when God splits the waters and Moses is going to pass through that, that river, it's the Red Sea or the reed sea. That's that part. So the next time we see Moses beside reeds at a sea, it's going to be when God separates the waters and demolishes the uh, Pharaoh's army. Right. So there's a lot of um, a lot of good foreshadowing here. It all takes place by the river. She doesn't pitch him. She plays him. This is a woman subverting the government. This is civil disobedience at its best. A woman, again, one who has no voice, no power, is subverting the government policy and going against legislation by doing the exact opposite of what the law tells her she should do, which is to pitch the baby in the river. Civil disobedience at its best. 
Verse 4, his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to the bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket or ark among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women, a nurse child for you? Uh, the sister... Then his sister said to, so that's Miriam, Moses' sister, said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get a nurse? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. Another unsung hero, this woman who is the daughter of Pharaoh, now undermines her own father in order to save life. So this constant undermining of Pharaoh's power right from under his nose, it all takes place by the river. Miriam is there on the scene. And, of course, uh, Miriam gets mom to Jacobet to, to nurse the baby. Uh, ver, uh, so the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. She took him as her son. And here's another name. We don't have Pharaoh's daughter's name. We don't have Pharaoh's name, but we have the name, and this name is Moses. Okay? Because, she said, I drew him up out of the what? Water. water. So there's that water. I drew him up. So while this legislation and this policy is to pitch babies in the water, we have these women who are literally in the act of being a part of God's story of delivering God's people to their ultimate salvation. Okay, this is women who, whom God is using as the deliverers of Israel to launch this part of the story into the next season of the gospel story. And that's your heroes of Exodus.